All right, so in this particular video, we're gonna really focus in on infection. We're gonna take a closer look at it and then also talk about some of the kind of common or uh, types of infections that you might see. So guys, an infection is an invasion of a microorganism. This microorganism then causes cell or tissue injury. So it's not just an organism gaining access and invading you, it's also causing damage, okay? And these microorganisms are gonna be things like viruses, bacteria, fungus, and then some things like that are called protozoas or worms or helminths. Those are going to be things that potentially could cause infection. Now you do have normal flora, like normal bacteria on your skin and in your body, and this type of bacteria actually helps protect you as long as it stays in the place it's currently located. If it decides to get into your body somehow, like let's say it gets a cut, you get a cut on your hand and it gains access, those can actually cause opportunistic infections like you can see here. An opportunistic issue is when normal flora becomes pathogenic during certain conditions. Now what does pathogenic mean? Pathogenic means it's a microorganism that causes disease. We call these a lot of times pathogens, and they're the microorganisms we like to study because those are the ones that obviously affect us in a negative way. So what are some conditions that microorganisms need in order to become pathogenic, to be a pathogen? Well, first of all, microorganisms have to gain access to your body through some type of portal of entry. This could be through your respiratory system, your digestive system, it could break through the skin, but it's gonna have to gain access inside of you somehow. We then see the pathogen has to resist your body's defenses. So remember we talked about an immunity, your first, second, and third line of defense. This is gonna have to evade those lines of defenses enough to be able to then make you sick. The next one is a high number of invading microorganisms is gonna increase their chances. Again, kind of like strength in numbers. And then if the host is in a vulnerable condition, let's just say they are already fighting an infection or they are taking medications that suppress their immune system, um, those types of things could make the host more susceptible and give the pathogen an easier chance of making you sick. So there's lots of different types of infections that we can look at. Now, when we look at infection, it can be a local infection and a local infection is gonna be located in a specific area. It's limited to where it's at. If that infection starts to spread, we call it disseminated. It's disseminating away from its point of origin and so it's spreading. If it spreads throughout the whole body, we call this systemic. So systemic is when it, you've got multiple areas that are having to work and fight this invader. Now, if the pathogen gets directly into the blood and it causes the blood to become infected, we call this sepsis. Okay, so sepsis is when the blood gets infected. Now, there are different types of microbial infections. These include bacterial. When we look at bacteria, remember bacteria is a prokaryotic cell, meaning it's simpler than our cells are. It doesn't have a nucleus, but it does have a cell wall and they can end up having lots of different defense mechanisms that can help them survive in your body. Viral infections are the smallest types of infections we have here. They are not considered living things. Okay, viral infections are gonna be caused by a nucleic acid within a protein capsid. They have to invade your cells in order to make you sick, because what they do is they hijack your cells to make more virus. Fungal infections come from a fungus. They can be yeast-like, okay, or they could be more mold-like. A lot of times fungal infections are gonna be more superficial, like on the skin or mucous membranes. Um, very rarely do they become systemic and go deeper into the body but it can occur. Parasitic infections include the parasites like with malaria, those are protists, amoebas like with amoebic dysentery. We also see that it could be like a worm infection with tapeworms. Those would be considered parasitic types of infections. So if you'll notice, we have lots of different kind of types. So I wanna go over another kind of flow chart with you and talk about how infection takes place. So 
this infectious agent, this pathogen, has to be located in some sort of reservoir. Okay, it's off, it's either infected another human or an animal. Um, it's in or located in the soil, your water, your food. It's somewhere where if we call it the reservoir. Now, in order for it to make you sick, it's got to leave the reservoir and it's got to be transmitted to you. Okay, this transmission could be direct transmission, like from person to person. It could be indirect transmission where like I sneeze on my hand and touch the doorknob and then you touch the doorknob. Okay, so that's through what we call fomites. Or it could be through droplets, like sneezing into the air and then you breathe those in. Another vehicle is it could be in, in water. The water could be contaminated. Your food could be contaminated. That's like with food poisoning. Or even the air. Vectors are going to be things that can transport it. And a lot of times these are arthropods. They're insects. This is like a mosquito or an arachnid, like a tick. We know that they carry diseases that can pass from one human to the next based on bites or even from an animal to a human. Okay, so this is a type of transmission. We then have to get it into the host. Now the host needs to be susceptible to getting sick. Okay, and there's a number of things that have to happen in order for them to actually get the infection. For one, this has to gain access. There's got to be a portal of entry that it gets into the body. Now, this could be through mucous membranes. It could be through the skin. It could be the parenteral routes where it, it, it punctures deeper, like into the muscle, if like it was a needle or something like that. But they've got to be able to gain access into your body and get through a lot of those first lines of defense. They then need to attach and penetrate into the host. This means they have to also evade the host defenses. When your immune system comes through and wants to try to catch it, they've got to be able to get away from that. Now, there's a number of things they may use to do this. Lots of microorganisms have special components that help them kind of dodge your immune system. This includes things like capsules, cell wall components that maybe help them hold on to structures as they move through things. Um, exoenzymes, enzymes that they secrete that can actually affect your blood or your white blood cells or the tissues around where they're located. We know all of these are enzymes because they all end in ACE. There could also be different variants or mutations of these microorganisms. And so some might be susceptible to certain medications while others aren't. Some might get caught by your immune system while others don't. And so that could become an issue. And again, they have to be able to invade you somehow. The more of them there are, the stronger their invasion would be. Ultimately, their goal is to damage your cells, okay? Cause some sort of damage inside of you. Now, they could do this a number of ways. They could deplete your iron stores. This is called uh, cytoporphin secretions where they actually take your iron stores and this could make you anemic. They could do direct damage to your host cells by actually killing them. They could release toxins, and there's two different ways. When we look at exotoxins, those are associated with gram-positive bacteria. They are going to target specific cell types, and a lot of times your body's going to make antitoxins against them. These antitoxins can be used to treat individuals by giving the antitoxin from somebody who's been exposed and giving it to somebody else, or even using it to make toxoids, which they use for immunizing people. That's like what we see with the tetanus shot. The tetanus shot is where the bacteria is going to produce lots of toxins, and we're going to utilize that in order to make a vaccine to protect you. These toxins get released by the bacteria. On the other hand, endotoxins, these are going to be released by gram-negative bacteria once they have been destroyed. When your immune system kills them, the fight's not over. These bacteria are like, you know what? I'm going to get the last word in. Even though you killed me, I'm still going to cause problems for you. So when the bacteria is killed, we see that it releases these endotoxins and they cause aches and fever to occur in the patient. They can even lead to complications like DIC, shock, and ultimately death if left uncontrolled. Okay, a lot of times pain relievers are going to help with the aches and fevers with this. But again, if your immune system is going to be killing a lot of these at once, those endotoxins could overwhelm your body. Now, when we look at treatment, 
We see that we could use different medications, but we could also do antibiotic therapy. This is great as long as the strand of, vi or of bacteria is not antibiotic resistant, which we'll talk about in a minute. But the whole point of all this part with prevention and treatment, it's to help boost your immune system so that your natural immune system can do the job it's supposed to do. It's just to help reinforce it and help it out. Ultimately, your immune system needs to be functioning in order to overcome an infection. Another thing we want to look at is this whole idea of chain of infection. In order to stop an infectious issue from occurring, we've got to break this chain. So the reservoir is where it's located initially, like whatever animal it might be located in, like with the swine flu, it's in pigs, but it can spread to humans, that kind of thing. It has to be able to leave the reservoir, so we have a portal of exit. It's got to be transmitted then to a new host and have a portal of entry, and then it can then infect the, the if the host is susceptible, it can infect them, and then the infectious agent can then start over. We've got to be able to break this chain somehow. And this is what lots of research and stuff goes into play whenever we have like epidemics, like if a disease is widespread in a particular area or even a pandemic like we see with COVID where it's worldwide, what are some ways that we can break this chain in order to overcome that infection? All right, and so there's multiple places we can try to break that chain in order to help patients and help their immune system and help with survival rates. So we have some examples here of infections. They're gonna be listed under here as the bacterial, viral, or fungal. These are not all of them, however. When we look at bacterial infections, there's several listed here, but there's other bacterial infections like streptococcus, um, E. coli infections, um, Pseudomonas, Shigella, Salmonella. Those are all types of bacterial type infections. But some of these infections are caused by your normal flora when they gain access into you and this is those opportunistic one of these could be cellulitis cellulitis is where the infection goes deeper than just the upper layer of your skin it gets into the dermis and the subcutaneous layers it can then spread very quickly and become systemic if left untreated you find cellulitis a lot of times in the lower extremities but it can happen pretty much anywhere Urinary tract infections or UTIs are infections that normally come from normal flora as well. Things like E. coli or stuff that shouldn't get up into your urinary tract area, but they are good in other places in your body. This can affect, of course, the urethra as it comes in and causing issues in that tissue, but it could also cause issues in the bladder. If it's an infection and inflammation in the bladder specifically, this is called cystitis. We see that women deal with cystitis more often because their urethra is only about an inch and a half long, and so bacteria has an easier chance of reaching into that bladder versus males where it's a longer journey to get to the bladder. We see that urinary tract infections can also travel up the ureters and even get into the kidneys and progress into what we call kidney infections. We also have staphylococcus types of infections. The one that's listed here is specific because it's a type of antibiotic resistant strand. This is called a me uh, methicillin resistant staphylococcus auroris. This type of staph infection is not gonna respond well to penicillin type antibiotics. And the reason it doesn't is it actually produces its own enzyme that breaks down the penicillin. So the penicillin tries to do its job, but this has a counterattack. So it kind of renders the antibiotic useless. Now these make it hard to treat certain things when, when bacteria mutate and change, and especially when they, they mutate to where they don't respond to medications we've used in the past. This makes treatment a little more complicated. We have to do new research to try to come up with even new antibiotics. The last one on this one for bacterial is Clostridium difficile. This one is a what we call C. diff type of infection. This is a very contagious bacteria that actually produces a toxin. This toxin is going to irritate your intestines and cause severe diarrhea. And that is one of the reasons why it can be super contagious. We also see it happens a lot of times in hospitals where it's passed as well as like long-term care facilities. 
This one ha does have a lot of antibiotic resistant strands and so it can end up being very difficult to treat. Now for viral infections, again, there's tons of different viral infections. There's the common cold, which is caused by corona type viruses. There's herpes simplex that causes cold sores. We have mononucleosis that causes mono, HIV, which we talked a little bit back in the immunity chapter, measles, mumps, rubella, the flu. Those are all types of viruses we've had to deal with or are dealing with in our society. We have respiratory syncytial virus, which is RSV. This is a virus that affects young children. Most children, pretty much all children, have been exposed to RSV by the age of two, and they also have an immunity that's kind of built up against it. The problem is that RSV causes a type of pneumonia, a viral pneumonia, and this can be life-threatening, especially if it's in very young children because their immune system has a harder time fighting it because it's still developing. Another viral infection or set of infections is hepatitis. The itis tells you that it causes inflammation and the hepta tells you that it's in the liver. So this is an inflammation of the liver and the liver can become damaged, which causes cirrhosis of the liver. There's several forms of this hepatitis type virus. There's a type A, so we have hepatitis A, B, C, and E. You've definitely probably heard about hepatitis B and C. B has a vaccine that's actually out that we get um, and most people, most kids get that nowadays. Whereas hepatitis C becomes an issue a lot of times with sharing needles or tattooing and that kind of stuff. It was a big deal. Um, and so with that, those two can cause major cirrhosis of the liver. A is a lot of times associated with a type of food poisoning and E you rarely hear about, but there's just different versions of this. And again, that's that whole idea of different variants that then respond differently to certain medications, certain treatments. When we look at fungal infections, again, there's different types of fungal infections like ringworm. It's not a worm, it's actually a fungal infection. Athlete's foot is part of this, as well as like vaginitis, where we've got inflammation of the vagina, and that one can actually be caused by the fungus that we see here. Candida albicans, it can actually cause yeast infections in the vagina, and that causes inflammation. Um, we also see, though, if this takes place in the mouth area, this is what we call thrush. A lot of times kids develop thrush because they explore the world with their hands and then put stuff in their mouth. This is a type of fungus that can be found on all kinds of different surfaces in soil, that kind of thing. So it's very common in kids to get this. However, in adults, it's not common for it to happen in the mouth. The only time we see thrush really develop in adults is if they're immunocompromised. So like individuals receiving cancer treatments or people who have like HIV. That's when you see a lot of times this type of fungal infection. Again, with fungal infections, most of the time we're gonna see that they are more superficial, located on the mucous membranes and the skin. All right, so what are some risk factors of developing infections? Well, age, of course, is one because if you're really young, your immune system's not ready to fight it, and if you're really old, your immune system is tired of fighting. So just like we saw in the last videos, age could play a role. Also, low socioeconomic status. This is gonna be where you don't necessarily have access to good food or clean water, um, good hygiene, all these things that potentially could help um, protect you from good developing or being exposed to infections. Another thing with low socioeconomic status is it could also affect your um, your abil ability to receive or get good health care, and so that could be part of that. A compromised host also has a higher chance of infection. Again, compromised hosts are those where the immune system has gone haywire somehow, okay, where it's normally going to be depressed or have some sort of issue. And then decrease sanitary conditions. Like if we don't wash our hands and do proper hygiene or if we don't have things cleaned very well, it could potentially increase your risk. Now for assessment. Again, we always take history and physical exam. CBCs are good here with the blood count. Um, we also may want to take a sample and do a culture of the infection. If we culture it out for a bacteria, we can grow it. We can figure out what bacteria it is. We can then test it against certain antibiotics to find out what it's susceptible to. This is going to help pinpoint treatment and make treatment better. We also see that we can look at specific tests that can test certain viruses, like we saw with Western blot and the ELISA back in the immunity um, video. 
Um, we also could culture out fungus and take a look at that as well. Another thing that we might utilize is not to identify the infection, but to identify the extent of the infection, the damage the infection's done. And this might be using radiographic tests like x-ray, CT scans, MRIs, things like that. All right, treatment here, guys, is super complicated. And this has to do with the fact that a lot of these things mutate and change. And when they mutate and change, it makes it more difficult. They won't respond to the same medications that they did before and things like that. So we need to try to be very specific when we're treating some of these infections. Now, primary type of intervention, the whole idea of trying to prevent it would be hand washing. That's one of the biggest things is teaching proper hand washing and so that we don't spread things as well with our hands. Another thing would also be immunizations, making sure that people are getting those immunizations who can get them, and that will help protect the kind of community as a whole. Secondary, when we look at this, there's not very much secondary screening that we can do with infections because it has a lot to do with when the infection's already present, but we can do some screening, especially with like sexually transmitted infections, so STIs, because some people are asymptomatic. So if they think they're exposed, we can do a screening and then we can then offer treatment if it's found before they potentially give it to other individuals. Now, when we look at other treatments, again, this will be specific sometimes based on what we're looking at, but sometimes PPE may be needed, especially if you're treating and you're working with patients in a hospital setting. Of course, gloves are gonna be, need to be used with patients, but you may even need gowns and more protective gear, and that might not be to protect you. It might be to protect the patient from you. If that patient is immunocompromised, you could end up sloughing off some of your own flora on them and cause them to get really sick. So sometimes it's actually to protect the patient more than it is to protect you. We also may use antimicrobial drugs like antibiotics. Again, finding which ones work are really important. Antivirals to help support your body vi fight viral infections. And then even antifungals. Nutrition is key here. As your body is trying to fight infections, you need to make sure you're giving it the calories and the nutrition it needs in order for it to be successful, as well as keeping it supplied with your fluids and staying hydrated. All right, so these are just all examples of kind of general treatments that we would use for pretty much any kind of infection.